my sign up. Hey, thanks for being here. All right, thanks for showing up. I think that's what it's all about at the end of the day. It's simply showing up because let it not be lost on anybody that these moments matter, right? You being here matters. You showing up matters. It's, it can be the difference. So I want to make sure I just start off there. It brings me great pride to be here with you all and to see the fact that you're showing up. Yesterday was National Vietnam Veterans Day. You know, and yesterday was the last day that combat troops came home from Vietnam. And at the same time, a flight from Travis Mac 177 was also returning home to recreate that flight. Because when they first stepped foot on U.S. soil, it was right here 50 years ago. And I think that's part of something special. And I think today is another opportunity for us to come together to reflect. When you reflect, I think it gives us an opportunity to figure out how can we rededicate ourselves in what so many others have done to pave the way. The, I'll, I'll just add on what I appreciate everyone being out here. I appreciate all the effort that's gone into this Operation Homecoming Celebration Week. Because as Chief said, these moments do matter. Our, our guest speaker, Captain Charlie Plum, uh, came back through Travis 50 years ago and has not been back to Travis since then. So, so 50 years, he'll be, he'll be returning to the place where he first returned after more than 2,000 days in captivity. And so what I appreciate about you all being out here, what I appreciate about these events, about Operation Homecoming, the theme is how we keep the faith. It's how those prisoners of war kept the faith with each other over those many years of captivity. It's how the collective team, Mobility Air Command at the time, uh, now uh, Military Airlift Command, now uh, Air Mobility Command, how they kept the faith in planning for that time when the air crew, maintenance, support, medical would all come together to bring nearly 600 prisoners of war home. They kept the faith. How the families kept the faith over those many years. And here today, this is how we keep the faith both to those previous generations, to know that we will always remember your sacrifice, we'll remember your legacy, and now it's, we've got the watch. We'll carry that legacy forward. And you being here sends that message, and it'll be an exciting few days. I thank you for what you do. Thanks for being out here, and let's get after some running here. Thank you. On behalf of the men and women of Team Travis, welcome to today's Operation Homecoming Facility for Naming Ceremony. exceptional honor it is to join with each and every one of you here today on such an incredibly special and historic day. To our many honored guests, our veterans representing each of the services and the proud lineage of the U.S. Armed Forces, to our families who embody the very best ideals of service and sacrifice, to our tremendous community partners and leaders, as well as the many leaders and teammates from Travis Air Force Base, thank you for being here. And certainly, most certainly, our deepest respect and admiration goes to our prisoner, prisoner of war veterans. You truly honor us with your presence, and we are grateful to share this moment and this time with you. Today, we join together to celebrate and mark the memorable occasion of the 50th anniversary of Operation Homecoming, an operation that spanned nearly two months in early 1973 and repatriated almost 600 American prisoners of war from captivity in North Vietnam. At the time, it was called Military Airlift Command's finest hour, as the hundreds of POWs, many of whom who had been held in the infamous Hanoi Hilton for years, were reunited with family and loved ones at military bases across.
across the United States. Travis Air Force Base served as one such new hub, beginning with the first set of Operation Homecoming flights on February 14th and culminating with the last two flights exactly 50 years ago, today, and tomorrow, with two Lockheed C-141 Starlifters sporting tail numbers 650238 and 650280 brought 34 returning heroes home to Travis and to freedom on the tarmac outside these exit doors right behind me. Air Force Colonel James Seahorn expressed the emotion of the moment when he recounted, as we neared Travis, we asked the aircraft commander for a good look at the Golden Gate Bridge. So many guys had dreamed of the bridge while they were gone. The aircraft commander got special permission and did a circuit around the bridge. The guys crowded into the cockpit and around every window to get a glimpse. The Golden Gate was a symbol of being home. Navy Lieutenant Commander Richard Stratton also recounted his experience at Travis when, as the senior officer, he first stepped onto the ramp and used a bank of microphones to address the gathered crowd. We stand here today as we have stood for so long, shoulder to shoulder. We are American fighting men and we have never forgotten. We have kept the faith. We have never wavered in our trust in our country and our trust in our fellow Americans. Following his remarks, the crowd burst into applause with many spontaneously breaking into song with God bless America. Today we pause to reaffirm what a grateful nation affirmed 50 years ago, that Operation Homecoming was a time to celebrate heroes, the very best of America and what this nation stands for. And these heroes, here in the first two rows, come in many forms. They come as the prisoners of war, whose bravery and commitment to duty while serving their country in the most difficult of circumstances serves as a moral North Star the bright shining beacon for the rest of us to follow. To our POWs, we honor you. <laughs> to the many service members across air crew, maintenance, support, and medical specialties whose selfless actions in the planning and execution of Operation Homecoming made the many, many happy reunions possible. Thank you. This team was led by then Major General John Gong, Commander of Operation Homecoming, who considers his participation in this operation the pinnacle of an extremely long and distinguished Air Force career. To General Gong and your team, we honor you. And certainly to the family members, who kept the faith across long periods of uncertainty, fear, and worry. You collectively represent the very best ideals of courage and commitment and sacrifice. To the family, we honor you. Today, we further cement your legacy of honor by dedicating this passenger terminal, the Operation Homecoming Terminal, so that the thousands upon thousands of future service Family members who will transit here will know and remember the heroes that truly defined a generation. And shortly we will transition to the tarmac for a similar dedication to the very spot where Operation Homecoming occurred, accompanied by aircraft nose art dedication honoring this 50th anniversary. And finally, we will conclude with a small presentation linking today's event to the Operation Homecoming Heritage Flight that occurred earlier this week, where Travis Bates C-17 and crew recreated the returning mission profile from Hanoi to Travis with remembered ceremonies in both Hanoi and Hawaii and now here. I sincerely thank all of, you, all of you for joining us today for this occasion and wish you the very best as we celebrate Oper Operation Homecoming today and across the years to come. Know we will never waver in our remembrance of you and those who remain missing in action. We will keep the faith. Thank you. Um, I was on about my 51st total mission. We were going in inbound, uh, just across the border of North Vietnam. <laughs> well, I am proud to represent the 
brothers of mine, and he refers to those and their families. Indeed, all of the men and women in uniform are hundreds of millions of Americans that prayed for this day 50 years ago. I want to thank each of you for helping us celebrate the most wonderful day of our lives that we are here in the Sword. Have us here for the faith of God. Thank you. We wondered for years how we would find that we were going home. How would they tell us? How would we react? We thought about it, we dreamed about it, we anticipated, we prayed about it daily for this day 50 years ago. We had no idea. You know, I wonder how would they tell us? Will we cry? Will we cheer? Will we hug and kiss everybody around us? We didn't know. Nobody else did. The first indication I had was that the enemy brought in a piece of wrapping paper and asked each of us to put our foot on the wrapping paper. <laughs> they traced around our foot on this paper. We were to get shoes. We don't shoe paste. We still weren't for sure because they tried to they tried to trick us many times. They come in, hey, you're going home today. All you have to do is sign this confession. Of course, the code of conduct was, no, we will not accept any of the release. And then they came in and brought in a pair of trousers, real pants, with a zipper. Hadn't seen a zipper in six years. <laughs> then it's a rough man. <laughs> he came in and told us we're going home. Here's how it happened. I was in a room with Jim Peary. You saw him on the second video. He tried to get him down and shake hands and told Jim Bond. He was our SRO, senior residing officer in that prison cell. The camp commander came in. We called him the rat. We have knew his real name. He looked like a rat. It was a rat. He opened the cell door wider than it had ever been opened. For the first time, there was no guard with an AK-47 locked behind him, ready to move all us down. We also saw the rat smile for the first time. He knew something was up. He looked at us, and he said, today's the day. Get on the bus. The war's over. We're trading prisoners. Jim Perry, our senior guy stood up. He faced the rat and made a lo very low ceremonious bow as we had been forced to do for all those six years. And he squared his jaw and he said, Sir, we're not going home until all the sick, injured, and innocent men have left this camp. And then we're going home in order. The rat was incredulous. He couldn't believe us. He said, Peary, I'm offering you your freedom. I never heard of Jim Peary's words. This is a, a lanky, slow walking, slow talking guy from Eight Mile, Alabama. And he squared his jaw and he said, Sir, freedom is vital to us, but not without our integrity. The rat hauled him out of there, put him in a stockade, beat him up pretty good, and he came back with the rest of us. The junior officer. He said, your senior guy has gone nuts. The rest of you will not be penalized for the mistake he made. Get on the bus. We didn't know what to do. We hadn't given, been given any last minute instructions. What do, you, what do you do when you don't know what to do? Have a meeting. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the first thing we decided, nobody could believe this. Try to explain this. To our wives and mothers when we get home, that we that we refuse our free ticket home, that we just couldn't go. So again, we told the camp commander, prove to us that the sick injured that have gone in and into the yard there. And he showed up with a with a printout, computerized sheet, signed at the bottom by Kissinger. And a note from Kissinger said, You boys go, get on the plane. So we formed a platoon outside that prison cell, 
when Jim Perry called, hey, we stuck the two, the three, the four as we marched out of there, proud Americans, on the bus, over the dike. We'd seen that in the airport before, the enemy's airport. Gianna. We'd never seen the sight we saw then. The United States Air Force C-141 sitting on a ramp. The flag on the tail, star on the side, wow. Still, no, re no response, no, nobody cried, nobody cheered, nobody had to kiss anybody else. They're waiting and wondering, when are we going to realize this is for real, we're going home. It wasn't until we boarded the 141, rolled down the runway, lifted on the end of the soil, it wasn't until we finally, over free waters, we all broke loose and started hugging and kissing the Air Force nurses. <laughs> Bill flew the same airplane with, uh, with uh, oh, you got Gary. Okay. I forgot, I forgot, I forgot you're, you're about to say. You flew with Jerry Denton. I'm sorry. I was in the room with that picture. Jerry uh, Denton was one of the senior officers in the prison camps and a very well respected guy. He came up after um, he became a flight. But I'm going to close with his comments because they're better than mine. And they're famous. He came off the airplane and he said, I want to thank our commander in chief and all the American people for making this thing possible. God bless America. Let me double check. Right on. Thank you so much. If I could take just a minute to read what the temporary plaque says here. Operation Homecoming from 14 February 1973 to 1 April 1973. Travis Air Force Base was at the heart of Operation Homecoming, welcoming a portion of the nearly 600 former prisoners of war held in captivity for years in North Vietnam. There were patriots, airmen, marines, soldiers, sailors, and civilians arrived on 14 C-141 flights. At Travis, the 22nd Air Force, 60th Military Airlift Wing, and David Grant Medical Center worked together on the effort to reunite families and express the appreciation of a grateful nation. If I could also draw your attention at this time too to the three aircraft behind me, uh, moving from your right to left, the C-17, directly behind me, the C-5, and then over here on the left, the KC-10. Uh, those are the aircraft that are here at Travis as part of the 60th Air Mobility Wing. And you'll note the nose arts on each of the aircraft displayed. That is the uh, original Operation Homecoming patch and logo but uh, updated to celebrate the 50th anniversary here today. And we'll have the opportunity to mingle around and get closer to take a look at those. Uh, two last things I'd like to do is, is also just to uh, recognize and make a note that uh, Congressman John Garamendi, representing uh, this district here in California, had entered into the congressional record the fact that we are commemorating Operation Homecoming, the 50th anniversary. So we have the congressional record here to, uh, for display. That's again, as a sign of the great And the last, last piece here, as I mentioned uh, earlier, uh, and what happened occurred earlier this week, we recreated the uh, Operation Homecoming flight, uh, returned from uh, Hanoi, uh, through uh, Hawaii, then back here to Travis. So representing uh, a complete team here from Team Travis, uh, went and uh, uh, led by uh, Colonel Ryan Garlow, the Vice Wing Commander, uh, had a small ceremony at the Defense POW MIA Accounting Agency with those ongoing efforts to continue to account for all of our service members who served, uh, visited the Hanoi Hilton, uh, paid those respects, and then participated in ceremonies in Hawaii and then back here. But it's, it's uh, our honor at this time, that team, that crew brought with them 50th anniversary coins that we would like to present to each of our POWs, again, from Hanoi back here to Travis. 
uh, just as, a, as a, again, a reminder of our gratefulness and our thankfulness for your service and for what you represent. We stand on your shoulders as we go forward, and uh, we're very grateful for this. So thank you. Attendance here, uh, both from the passenger uh, terminal renaming ceremony, and now to this small, shorter portion, where I'd just like to highlight a, a few key elements. Uh, first and foremost, this is the tarmac where... sacrifice and then something I've always said is you got to think of the families that uh, for each one of us that were there the moms and dads the spouses the loved ones brothers and sisters uh, when I finally got home I could see the toll that it had taken on my parents and they were very active in this whole program and so I always like to give a major shout out to uh, say the wives the parents, the siblings, everybody, all the loved ones that sacrificed along with us. And uh, I always said, I'd rather spend the rest of my life in the worst conditions I was ever in than to have either one of my sons go through what I went through. So uh, it tells you sort of what the family set me on to. So anyway, uh, this is the original car. Uh, there's some very interesting stories here for folks to talk to you about. Uh, appreciate a lot of those. Uh, what a spectacular! I want to thank uh, Travis, Phil uh, Salmon, and everybody here. Uh, what a spectacular presentation! Uh, and that's our and uh, you know, I just uh, you folks have done. Uh, I think we're all taken back at just what a wonderful uh, job you have done for all of us, and last night as well. So, uh, our gratitude to all of you, and thank you so much.
You can imagine we're uh, high visibility uh, with Congress, the family members, uh, veteran service organizations. We actually have quarterly updates with all the national leadership of, of veteran service organizations to give them an update on the status of cases. Um, so this is just a snapshot of what we're doing in 2023. So we have uh, 40 countries and territories that we're operating in and organically, which is just teams filled with DPAA team members um, and augmentees from the various services uh, that support us going out to the field. So we have 29 investigations, I think it's 11, 17 recovery teams that are organic. So an investigation is really, I equate it to, we send out an anthropologist, a scientific recovery expert, team leaders, uh, team sergeants, and they, um, kind of kick the dirt around. They go out and look. We look for any kind of material evidence. We have life support investigators uh, that are experts in aircraft. Uh, they can identify pieces and parts of an ejection seat and tell you what aircraft that came from. They can identify oxygen masks. I mean, and you know, I'm talking scraps of these things that we're finding. And it really uh, just is amazing. So the Vietnam War, like I said, it's our operational priority. Our first excavation was just over 35 years ago. And like, so we have teams there today. Uh, last year, we identified two um, service members from the Vietnam War the entire year. This year already, we've identified four. So that kind of gives me hope. We've actually created a team called the Vietnam War Identification Project within our lab. And they're kind of going back through cases, uh, working some of the older cases, trying to turn up leads where we didn't have leads before. Technology is advanced even in time, so we're able to get those things. Um, during COVID, our partnership with Vietnam, there's an organization called the Vietnam Office of Seeking Missing Persons. They, uh, during COVID, we couldn't deploy. We were locked down. The Vietnam teams actually did recovery missions on our behalf, and we identified two Vietnam War veterans are missing in action from, from their efforts. So really, I mean, it's just an example of the partnership that we've made since that time. Um, Korean War, there's over 7,000 missing from the Korean War. 5,000 of those are in North Korea. Uh, you can imagine access there is tough. But uh, we have a really strong partnership with South Korea, uh, work missions. We, in 2018, North Koreans turned over 55 boxes uh, to our folks. Of those 55 boxes, uh, you know, they, they told us 55 boxes, 55 remains. There were over 250 unique DNA sequences in those boxes. From those boxes, so it's sort of like getting a, a thousand piece puzzle box dumped on a table with no box cup top cover. Uh, we, we did a repatriation a couple of years ago. Um, president Moon at the time, uh, the president of South Korea was there, Admiral Aquilino represented. And a cool story with that is not only did we repatriate six Americans back home, but we returned 68 South Korean soldiers back to South Korea. Uh, one of those soldiers that was identified, his granddaughter was a lieutenant in the Korean army. So she flew out, that she was flown out to the ceremony and escorted her grandfather on the plane, on the president's plane, and took him back home to her family. Just, I mean, those kind of stories are just amazing. <laughs>